Now, anyone can do a Karazhan guide, but can anyone do a Karazhan guide with no footage and it still be useful? Let's find out. If you find this useful or remotely amusing, then make sure you like, make sure you subscribe. This is going to be a very unique format, mark my words. But you'll get everything that you need to know about Karazhan and about downing all 11 buses, and you won't even need to see any game footage. That's beautiful. Should we have a look? Obviously, make sure you come follow me on Twitch, ScottyJ87, streaming most nights. So, first up, we have Ataman. Anything you need to know? Not really. Pretty much a tank and spank. There's a few things that we're going to go over. You don't really need any special composition from this. Pretty standard. Two tanks, two healers, mixed of DPS. If you've got someone who can decurse, so a boomy or a mage, brilliant, or a resto druid, obviously. But someone who can decurse will make it easier. If not, you might just have to watch your fret a little bit. But let's have a look at how we do it. So once you've cleared the trash towards Ataman, you'll find a neutral horse, so not hostile. Enter Midnight. Midnight needs to be pulled and tanked by the off tank, which will be Captain America. All your casters and melee need to stand behind the boss. Put all damage on Midnight. After a short while, enter Ataman. When Ataman comes in, you'll need your other tank to tank it close to the horse, but out of cleave range of your off tank. All DPS go full pew pew on the horse, and phase two will start when Midnight gets to 25%, at which point Ataman will mount his horse, but for this example, the horse is far too big. So we'll get rid of that and pretend Ataman is on his horse. Now there's two ways you can do this. Firstly, you have your main tank who's on Ataman still and everybody stacks behind, including the other tank and nuke as hard as physically possible. This is so Ataman will never charge. Another strategy is to have your off tank move behind the group and then when the charge happens, he'll charge the tank and run back to the other tank. Now one thing to look out for is occasionally a curse will go out on your entire raid. It can be resisted, but this is where your boomies and your mages and your resto druids, anybody with a decurse should be decursing. The order of the decurse is you want to get it off your tank first because it reduces your chance to hit. You don't want your tank to not be getting fret on this guy. Secondly, if you've got a big pumper like a warlock pumping into the boss, prioritize your big damage dealers next, but always do your tank first. If this guy is at the back soaking the charge, he don't need the cursing. Who cares if he hits? For all we care, he could be dead. At least we don't get no charges. My preferred strategy is to have everybody stack behind the boss, big nuke, decurse, boss dies, free loot. Give me that fat mount. One other thing to remember. Enter horse again. When horsey gets to 25% and phase two begins, all threat will be wiped, which means don't DPS. Because when Ataman merges with Horsey and he's riding him, you need to make sure your big tank gets all the fret first for your guys stand up and begin pumping. Next up, we've got Moros. Now Moros is a bit of a pain. You want some CC. So the fight consists of Moros and four adds. They're all undead. So you want shackles, traps, even turn undead from paladins, but you definitely want to be able to control, I'd say a minimum of two of the adds. So a shackle and a trap, I would say is the bare minimum you want to be doing this boss with, but you can probably tailor this fight to your group. But I think going with less than two CC is not ideal, but let's have a look how we do it. Once you've cleared the awful, 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 awful ballroom, before you get to Morrow's, you'll be surrounded by feasts and tables and jolly undead party goers. But when you look up, you will see, enter Moros. Moros is not alone though. Moros will have four undead companions. Enter Moros' companions. Now these four undead companions are undead. That's why I said undead companions. So what you need to do is you need to make sure that you assign CC on at least two, preferably three if you can. If by some fluke, You've got enough to CC all four. Keep all four CC the entire fight. Nuke the boss. But that's highly unlikely. Now, the only difficult thing about this fight is the start and maintaining control. So first, enter our tanks. Now, the tanks will need to pull the boss and they need to be first and second threat on Moros the entire time. If one of the undead adds is a caster, they're absolutely fine to be tanked by DPS. Let's say you've got two CCs. Now the adds are either Protection Warrior, Arms Warrior, Rep Paladin, Holy Paladin, Holy Priest, Shadow Priest. That is about it. 
We personally opt to CC the ones that can dispel other CCs. So Shackelin, the Paladin, or maybe the Holy Priest. We normally prioritize the Shadow Priest. So let's say you've shackled this guy, you've shackled, maybe you've got a Shadow Priest and a Holy Priest. That would be beautiful. Let's pretend you've not got a Hunter. So you've shackled one, you've shackled the other. You need your off tank to tank the two adds while they get burned down, whilst also maintaining second aggro on the boss. Once one ad is dead, the fight now gets a hell of a lot easier. So let's say you've got one left. Always remember, your interrupters should be interrupting. So if you're nuking, say this is a healer that you're nuking down, you need to make sure that you're interrupting heals, you're interrupting everything you can. If it's the Shadow Priest you're burning down, interrupting mana burn is absolutely essential. So these two are still being shackled all the way through the fight. The second ad is now dead. Now it's easy. Roughly every 30 to 35 seconds, one of the tanks will get gouged. So this tank gets gouged and it's out the fight. The boss instantly switches to your off tank. Everybody is nuking this boss. This tank may now get gouged and this tank now takes back over. It's also very useful to keep abolish poison on your tanks purely because he does a blind. If one gets gouged, one gets blind, you're not gonna be having a great time. Now at this point, it pretty much is a tank and spank. The only thing you need to take into consideration which will go on through the entire fight is occasionally Moros will vanish and then he will, using this now as we'll pretend it's a DPS, he will appear behind the rot, that mother funster, and then go back to its regular fret table. Now this guy is taking lots of damage from a ticking dot. Now mages, you can ice block it. The most common method of removal is using your paladins blessing of protection so communicate this guy should be going i've got bleed on me on discord and then one of your paladins will call to say he'll blessing of protection don't try and waste blessings of protections on people who can immune it their self so if this guy was a paladin he'd shield now he's still got his blessing of protection for someone else the more immunity effects you can use to remove the bleed the easier time your healers are going to have kill that boss and loot it next up we've got maiden the only thing that makes this fight a lot easier is having good timers to know when repentance is going to come in. There's not really much that you need outside of that. Definitely a few people that can dispel magic just to get rid of the holy fire that goes on people. Other than that, fairly straightforward. Dancing in and out of the Consecrate, but let's get into the detail. Once you've cleared your way to Maiden of Virtue, enter Maiden of Virtue. She is a big giant woman who drops an amazing healing weapon. Firstly, what you want to do is have your tank, tank maiden in the middle of the room. All your ranged DPS should be spread around the circle outside in between all the pillars around the room. There's steps going down. You want to be stood just at the top of the steps. So you're out of the consecrate that's going to be going around the boss all the time so you don't get silenced, but close enough that you can quickly react. And when Maiden does a spell called Repentance, which is exactly as it sounds and takes you out of the fight for a long, long time, just before that comes in, you can move in slightly just so you're in the consecrate, but all still spread. Repentance will hit. Consecrate will tick. Goodbye, Repentance. Move back. To your positions melee you need to be extremely careful on this fight you'll dps from behind the boss preferably in a triangle formation because she does a holy wrath that when it hits one guy this guy if this guy is stood too close it will chain the range is stood too close it will chain and it does a lot of damage so that's why i always want to be spread you want the minimum amount of melee as possible, preferably one at max melee range on the left leg, one max melee on the right leg. And then there's only one more mechanic that you need to deal with, and that's Holy Fire. Holy Fire is an extremely harsh dot. This guy is about to get Holy Fire. If he doesn't get dispelled, he will fall over. So anybody who can dispel, including your tank, if it happens to be a paladin, should be looking at a decursive. If this guy now gets Holy Fire, dispel him instantly. Keep nuking. Move on to the next boss. And now we've made it to Opera. Obviously, Opera consists of one of three possible fights. So you've got Wizard of Oz, Big Bad Wolf, and Romeo and Juliet, basically. All right, it's Romulo and Juliana, whatever her name is, but you get what I mean. 
The only one that's remotely difficult is probably Wizard of Oz, just because it needs a bit of coordination. But ideally, composition-wise, when you're going up to Opera, you do want someone that can do reliable fire damage. So actually, preferably, you want a Warlock for this. But a Mage can work as well. The only reason a Warlock makes it easier is because they can actually control two of the adds at the same time. So preferably, I'd like to go in with a Warlock. But let's have a look at what you do for all three fights. Now, onto the Opera event. Some people's most favourite fight. Now there's three possible ones. We'll start with the easiest one first. So Big Bad Wolf. Enter Big Bad Wolf. Big Bad Wolf will be tanked over to one side. All of your DPS will be DPS in from the other side. And of course your melee will be stood behind. Now melee, you get a lot less time to react than anybody else. But the entire mechanic of this fight when you hear run away little girl, you run away little girl. One of your raid will be turned into Little Red Riding Hood or Little Red Riding Gnome. So let's say this guy turns into it, instantly Big Bad Wolf will start running towards him, you get a movement speed increase, you run away, you run away quicker than he can catch you. Just run round the outside of the room and don't get hit. As soon as that's over, you can move back into position, the boss will continue to be tanked, this is the boss. With your DPS, continue into DPS. And it's basically free loot. Good job, Thor. So for Romulo and Julianne, or better known as Romeo and Juliet, you'll start with Julianne first. Where the boss is located in the room really does not matter. So let's have Captain America tanking her. Now, the most important thing here is eternal affection gets interrupted. It's a two second cast time and is a heal. So this needs to be interrupted the whole way through the fight. Now, there is also a buff that she gains called Devotion. If she gets this buff, make sure it's dispelled instantly. She does some other stuff as well, which you can interrupt, but it's not overly important. If you've got spare interrupts, then interrupt everything that you can. But really, your main focus should be the heal, interrupting eternal affection. Once she falls over and dies, enter Romulo. Now you wanna get Romulo as close to the wall as possible. So this is Romulo, this is your tank. This is so, when your melee DPS are DPS in, they don't get knocked too far because Romulo does a backward lunge which strikes an enemy behind the caster and it's a 35 yard knockback. So you don't want to be getting knocked across the room. Knocked just a couple of yards into the wall is absolutely fine. He also gains daring which needs to be dispelled which daring increases his damage by a substantial amount and it's a damage buff that we don't want on this guy. He also stacks a poison, which reduces your tank's stats, which you will want to be dispelling. An abolished poison here is absolutely amazing. Just because your DPS are getting knocked into the wall, don't think that you should move and DPS from the front. He does a big fat cleave to three targets in front of him. So you have to DPS from behind and take that knockback. In the next phase, your melee are probably not going to be on this guy, and we'll get into that now. So when Romulo falls over and dies, both of them, you are now fighting together. Everything applies from phase one with Julianne and phase one with Romulo. So enter your second tank. It doesn't matter who's tanking what. Iron Man is going to tank Julianne. Captain America is going to tank Romulo. Same as before, keeping his back against the wall. But you need to split your DPS. So preferably range DPS. This is our range DPS are on Romulo, so that now eliminates that knockback for the melee, and your melee are on Julianne. Now both of these bosses still need dispelling, so if you've got a priest or a shaman, or both preferably, assign a purge to one, a dispel to the other, or if you've only got one that can dispel, that's unlucky, you're going to be busy because you're going to be doing both. Eternal Affection on Julianne still needs to be interrupted to stop the heal. Now the important thing here is both these bosses need to die at the same time or within 10 seconds of each other. So you should be splitting your DPS. Hopefully you've got a couple of melee that you can put on Julianne, probably not a rogue, and all your ranged to go on this guy here. Now if you've got Ellie Shamans, you could potentially put your Ellie Shaman on Julianne instead of a melee if you're low on melee to interrupt the heal. The main thing is getting this heal interrupted. Anything else you can interrupt is a bonus, as I said but both need to be purged or dispelled. As soon as they're low on health, nuke both, they die. Epic loots pop up, you win, you move on. Now for Wizard of Oz, this is probably quite a difficult one to explain. There's four adds, technically five if you count the wolf. So we'll go through each one at a time. So we have Dorothy, we have 
Tin Man. We have Raw. Who won't stand up. We have Raw. And we have Straw Man. This is Raw. We'll start with Raw first. Now, like I said, this fight is a lot, lot easier if you've got a Warlock. Because a Warlock will keep Raw feared the entire time. We'll pretend he's feared. He's out of the fight. And he will use fire spells on Straw Man to keep him disorientated. So he doesn't know what's going on. So basically, Raw needs to stay feared one way or another. Straw Man gets disorientated by fire spells. So your Warlock's job should be taking these two out of the fight completely. That leaves us with Dorothy, her little dog that we've not even put on the table because it's pointless, and Tin Man. Tin Man will be tanked, preferably by your strongest tank because he does start to deal more damage as the fight goes on. Now he can be slowed, he can be given rust with Sunder Armor and Frost Spells. I wouldn't recommend it. If your tank starts getting spanked, then by all means, get some rust built up on Tin Man and kite him around. But I really don't see it as an issue, so just tank him out of the way. It's not going to be long until Dorothy and her dog are dead. Once Dorothy and the dog are dead, focus on Raw. Having your off tank, pick him up. Once Raw is dead, Straw Man, from all the fire spells of being disorientated the entire time, should also nearly be dead. But either way, have your tank pick him up, nuke him down. Now you're just left with Tin Man. At this point, your tank might be taking quite substantial damage. But big nuke on Tin Man, or Tin Head, I don't know, call him whatever you want, and he's dead as well. And then enter the Crone. Fairly straightforward. All your DPS just spread around, nuke the Crone, There'll be whirlwinds going all around where you'll start spinning up and around and in the air and all that sort of thing. But at this point, it's just a tank and spank. So tank the crone, all your DPS, spread around, nuke the crone, have fun in the whirlwinds because you're going to do it. Even if you don't want to, you're still going to do it just because it's fun flying around in the air. Nuke the boss and loot. And then we're at Curator. Curator is probably the first DPS check and probably one of the fights where a prop paladin isn't the ideal main tank for it. But you can make it work, you've just got to be careful of threat. The reason for this is it takes 95% less damage pretty much the vast majority of the fight, making paladins gaining threat quite difficult. But as long as your DPS are careful, I'm not saying it's something that you can't do. This is of course where you get your first tier 4 pieces, so happy days. And you only need one tank for this, so get your off tank to start doing some damage or healing. It's quite a test on the healers, this one, because the healers do need to last long enough, obviously, to kill the boss. But let's look at how it happens. Now for Curator. Curator is a fairly straightforward fight, but like I said, it can be a bit of a test on your healers and your DPS. So enter Curator. He takes 95% less damage pretty much all the way through the fight. And he also does a hateful bolt on his second threat target. Don't think that this means you need two tanks. Anybody with a reasonable health pool will be able to soak this damage. Healers should be looking at who's second on threat and as a hateful bolt's being casted, preemptively casting a heal to top that person off instantly. There's various locations you can tank him. Some tank him in the doorway, some tank him in the middle of the room, some tank him against the wall. Really, just find what works for you and have your tank tank him wherever you like. We personally like tanking him in the door, so all the sparks spawn on the right hand side, pretty much in the same place. All your DPS should be spread around, not necessarily around the boss, but around the general area of the room. And periodically, he'll spawn a spark. I got nothing that sparkles, so we'll use a Lego brick. A spark will come, it will wander around, and it will chain damage between everybody it's near. This needs to die fast. All your DPS should turn round, all at the same time, your melee charge into that spark and you blow it up. Then you wait for the next one to spawn. Other than Curse of Doom for Warlocks and timing it right so Doom goes off when the damage vulnerability starts, there's no point doing anything to the boss. Full focus should be, as soon as this new spark comes in, you will rush to it and blow it up. Obviously, these sparks continue to come one at a time and being blown up one at a time until he runs completely out of mana, at which point he begins to cast Evocate. While he's Evocating, he takes ludicrous amounts of damage. So it's this point where all your DPS should be fully focused on smashing that boss down as quickly as possible. Side note, he will have a spark spawned a couple of seconds before he goes ohm. My suggestion is completely ignore that spark, 
nuke the boss, heal through this spark, and then play catch up afterwards. There is literally nothing else to mention. It's just repeat. As soon as he's finished evocating, so he's not taking any additional damage now, your raid will then get back into position, ready for the next round of sparks. All take the spark down, blow the spark up, rinse and repeat. He will then start evocating again. Everybody turns back round, nukes the boss. Obviously, focus heals on whoever is second threat so if you know your second threat watch for those hateful bolts use a personal cooldown and do as much damage as physically possible on this guy while he's evocating ideally by the third evocate maximum he should be dead now that's part one now i appreciate you're probably like why why are you splitting it in two parts this low budget piece of garbage you know must have only took you five minutes actually this video took an incredibly long amount of time i'm being serious so i've split it in two because it's quite long anyway you know by the time i get through the next six bosses you're looking at an hour long video so i thought first half up to the point where you get your first tier piece and then the next half will obviously be all the way up to prince and obviously we'll be covering Nightbane and Never Spite as well. So hopefully this is a bit more digestible anyway. You know, you can watch the first half ready for your first raid because you might not clear it all in one. Who knows? Don't know how difficult it's going to be. I was just having a bit of fun. If you enjoyed it, you know, great. It's not your conventional type of raid guide, let's face it. And you know what I'm like? I like to be different. So I'll see you on the next one.